Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am genuinely honored to introduce our guest. In 2019, U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, was the focus of international interest when Donald Trump and his allies targeted her amidst their efforts to pressure Ukrainian officials to in investigate Joe Biden's family. This scandal led to the first impeachment proceedings against Trump, a major aspect of which was the ambassador's impassioned and steadfast congressional testimony. The child of parents who fled Nazi and Soviet atrocities, Ambassador Yovanovitch has served in numerous senior State Department positions, including U.S. Ambassador to Armenia, U.S. Ambassador to Kyrgyzstan, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. She retired from the U.S. Foreign Service in 2020 and is currently a diplomat in residence at Georgetown University's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. Tonight, Ambassador Yovanovitch is joined in conversation with Mitchell Orenstein, Department Chair and Professor of Russian and East European Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in welcoming Marie and Mitchell to the Free Library. So thanks, everybody. Uh, it's great to see everybody here tonight, and I'm super honored to be on the stage, honestly, with Marie Yovanovitch, the former ambassador to Ukraine and a number of other countries. Uh, I, I can say that, you know, I, I first learned of you, really, when, um, when the hearings happened. Mm -hmm. And immediately, I think, when seeing you uh, dealing with that, I just had, I, I've always admired a lot, of the, the very strong government officials, honestly, we have in Washington, D.C. and international affairs. I mean, there's just a lot of expertise mm -hmm. there. And uh, to see you kind of uh, attacked, I guess you could say, or, or, or put, put on the defensive in that sort of way, and, and your reaction to it, I think it really affected a lot of us, you know, mm -hmm. just how hurt in a way you sort of seemed at that time and sort of how indignant uh, you sort of seemed at being put in that position. I just wanted to say thank you for, um, for thank doing you. that. So. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, Thanks. Thank you. Well deserved. So I, I do want to begin, you know, the book, I, I've read it twice now because, of course, <laughs> you're going to come in March and, you know, I didn't, I forgot all the details, you know, between March and April, but I read it again. <laughs> and I, I, I did have to remark that, um, that you know, the, the best part of the books in some ways were really the early parts for mm -hmm. me, just talking about your life. And I just wanted to ask you a question, you know, how, how did your background as being essentially a kind of, you know, Russian American or Russian Serbian American affect your decision to kind of go into to the Foreign Service in the first place. Yeah, thank you. So when I wrote this book, um, you know, I had a number of different goals in mind, but one of them was to honor my parents, who were immigrants to the United States, um, who had, um, you know, grown up during World War II in Europe, uh, fleeing, you know, the communists, the Nazis, uh, and finally, you know, finding a place in Connecticut where they could bring up their family. And they sacrificed a lot for, for our family. And, um, but they uh, were so grateful that they had found this safe haven in the United States, that they could worship as they pleased, that they could say what they wanted to say, that they could live in freedom. And, um, you know, I think that's because uh, they had lived under um, authoritarian regimes, and they knew what it was like not to be free. And so they really valued the freedom that the United States offered. And they brought up my brother and I to, uh, to value that as well and to be grateful. Uh, we are Americans by choice. Uh, you know, you have to think about it if you um, actually make an application to become an American citizen. And again, that was something that was very precious to, to our family. And one of the things that my parents um, always said, even though, you know, we were, um, you know, hardly wealthy, <laughs> Um, but that we were fortunate. We were the fortunate ones because we had good educations, we had opportunities, and that meant that you had to give back. I mean, I think it was part of their, their faith upbringing that you have to give back, um, but it was also part of being, being an American and, and helping others. And so, you know, as often happens when you're young, you know, I took a bunch of detours, did a, a number of different things. Uh, but um, when I thought about you know, how do I give back? I thought about 
um, joining the government, serving the American people, and marrying that up with my interest, um, like you, in you know foreign mm -hmm. affairs, in history, in travel. Uh, frankly, you know, I love to travel. I like to meet different kinds of people in different kinds of places, eating the food, seeing the sights. I mean, all of that was kind of in my wheelhouse. And at the same time, hopefully, I would be making a difference and um, giving back uh, to the United States, which had given us so much. So that was, you know, yeah, part no, that's of, terrific. Part of it. I mean, one thing that that I, this is probably like you'll you'll feel like this is an odd question in a way, <laughs> but you mentioned several times in the book the Vietnam War, just like very briefly, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think for people of your generation, that was like a really formative political experience, it was. right? And yet you don't mention in that early part, you know, how that was part of your experience exactly. Like, so, so how did you experience the Vietnam right. War? And did you have any people that, you know, that, like, what, what was the experience like? Was it, were, did you have connections with the anti-war movement? Did you have people you knew who died there? I mean, what, what was your relationship to that? And how did you end up feeling about, did that change your, the way you felt about service to the U.S. government? Yeah. So I was born in 1958, grew up um, during the 1960s. I mean, the, your, those formative childhood years, was a teenager in the 1970s. And the Vietnam War was, um, you know, all around us at that time. And of course, there were other cataclysmic events, the assassinations that happened in the 1960s, the big demonstrations and so forth. And, you know, I was just a kid, but it affects you. I mean, you're watching it on, uh, on the news. Um, you know, adults were talking about it. As I got older, you know, we discussed things in class. And um, I can't say it was really that much of a personal um, kind of effect, but when I was in fifth grade, uh, one of my um, best friends, Diane Stoddard, her, her brother uh, died in Vietnam, and he died in a particularly heroic way where uh, the helicopter that was coming in, he, he had been wounded, uh, a number of people were wounded, um, they were, you know, picking them up in baskets. Um, they were coming, there was a lot of incoming fire. And um, Norm, uh, which was very typical of him, said, don't strap me in, let's just go, it's too dangerous. And um, sadly, he did not make it because the basket didn't make it. And so that was, you know, as a fifth grader, that was, you know, a very compelling story uh, about sacrifice and, uh, you know, what you do for your buddies in the field, even if, um, uh, you know, as you know, many in my parents' circle did not agree with the war itself, but you have to honor, you know, the individuals who fought in that war. But that's not what happened when people came home. And so all of that, you know, was, uh, you know, just out there kind of formatively um, in my uh, growing up years. Uh, and, um, you know, then, of course, as I became older and looked at it at a little bit as history, right, um, and uh, what the military did in order to transform itself after a war that, um, you know, even people who were in favor of that war agreed that we were not prepared to fight that war and we didn't do it in, in, the, in, in the way we should have done. And so the military, with huge prodding, of course, from Congress, um, uh, transformed itself. They had a crisis. They looked hard at themselves and they transform themselves. And I think that was also a really important lesson for me, especially, um, you know, later on when um, I was a, a more senior diplomat that, um, you know, why does it always take a crisis for us to look hard and reform ourselves? And, you know, I think about the foreign, so this is going far afield from your original question, That's fine. but I think about the State Department and the Foreign Service um, which needs reform. I mean, we need to be thinking about the challenges of the 21st century um, and, uh, you know, what are those challenges and how do we meet them? Uh, and I don't think enough hard thought is being put into that right now. And so that, um, that is, you know, a, a real concern. There was a, uh, a recent study um, done, uh, done by Harvard, a number of former diplomats put it together, and this was one of the points they made. After the Vietnam War, the military reformed. After 9-11, the intelligence services were forced to reform. And the State Department, arguably, there's been, you know, an under-resourcing, lots of crises. Are we as strong and, and, um, and nimble as we need to be for the challenges of today? Um, and I think we're due and overdue for that reform now. Wonderful. Yeah. Now, one of the things as a sort of idealistic, can I say, yeah. um, young person coming into the Foreign Service, 
uh, you know, with this notion of giving back, with the notion, you, you would describe yourself as a rule-abiding person, <laughs> which I, I was joking out behind, that's a difference <laughs> between <laughs> us, perhaps, but um, but I think that, uh, you know, it was interesting hearing you talk about that, and those revealing moments, and the sort of insights, you know, in the book are fantastic, but um, but you, you, you enter a State Department, which is very male-dominated, shall we say, very, um, you know, um, you know, hierarchical, Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in a way, sort of misogynistic, is, essentially, right? And and it seemed to me, I don't know, looking, reading it the second time, I sort of felt like, well, you know, that that actually you had a harder time dealing with the State Department, <laughs> in a way, than you did with like anything else in your early life, right? Dealing with that, that maybe it wasn't the first time that you'd you'd faced that mm -hmm. sort of issues, but it, it seemed to to sort of create a lot of issues for you, actually. Could you just explain yeah. some of those or give us a couple examples from the mm -hmm. book about yeah. that? Yeah, and um, so if, if I could just start with the rules abiding uh, <laughs> diplomat, <laughs> and that is absolutely true. That is me. I mean, I follow I follow the rules. Um, I pretty much always have. It doesn't mean I haven't strayed and made mistakes and all that, um, but mostly, um, mostly I follow the rules. Um, but that doesn't mean that one shouldn't be a critical thinker. Uh, and it doesn't mean that if you think a rule or a regulation or s just mm -hmm. we're doing something that's wrong because it's always been done that way, I'm sure nobody has heard that saying in this room, um, that you shouldn't think about it and um, not just complain about it, but suggest how it can be fixed. Um, one, of, uh, one of my old bosses, um, the Undersecretary for Political Affairs, Mark Grossman, um, when we would come in and talk about, they are saying this and they are doing that, and why did they make us do X? And he would say, who is they? They is us. We need to fix it. Um, and, you know, that was a real challenge, I think, to kind of mid-level officers that we need to take ownership of, of what the issues are. So, so yes, I'm a rules follower, but that doesn't mean that, you know, like I'm mm -hmm. a little sheep that's <laughs> you know, following along. Yeah, exactly. You that's a thread, if you don't mind me interrupting for a second. That's a thread I wanted to work through this conversation, because where we get to, of course, <laughs> is the end of this road is that, yeah. you know, you're, you're put in a position. But anyway, uh, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. No, no, please. not at all. Uh, the last uh, thing I'd say about being, you know, the, the, the little rules follower is that, um, you know, and, and this is going to sound like I am a real bureaucrat. Um, but, you know, rules can be our friends because they provide us. <laughs> I know, you're like going, how, how am I on the stage with this person? <laughs> Maybe everybody feels that way. Um, but they, 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 they give us, um, you know, kind of guideposts and guidelines, um, sort of right-left margins in terms of, of how we can operate. And I'll give you kind of a, a, a silly example maybe, um, but... Um, but I think it's a good example because it's, it's, it's pretty clear. So we have very stringent, very stringent rules in the U.S. government about what kind of gifts we can accept. And it's very clear. Um, and, of course, I was in many gift-giving cultures. And, you know, what do you do? Well, it's very clear what the regulation is. And if you stick with it and you say, you know, these are our rules, um, it's, um, you know, eventually your host country's um, folks will, will, will understand that. And so when I was in uh, Armenia, uh, well, uh, a national airline that will not be named, uh, would, um, you know, offer, um, offer everybody, you know, uh, diplomats like me, first class travel. I mean, which was a gift of thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And um, I'll tell you, Armenia is very, very far away from the United States. <laughs> and it was really hard to say no. <laughs> um, but um, everybody on that plane, because the thing is, people watch you. And everybody on the plane knew that I was sitting back in coach. And so, you know, people who were sitting up in business class, whether they were diplomats who had accepted the upgrade or whether they were business people who, whose companies were paying for it but who wanted to talk to me on the long, long flight back to America, um, <laughs> you know, they would, they would come back and talk to me and they would all comment on that. And for the Americans, it was a point of pride that, you know, we Americans were sticking to the rules. And, you know, not that I think anybody can be bought for a business class ticket, but it's a slippery slope. And, it, you know, where does it get you? And so if you just stick to the rules, they can be your friends. <laughs> <laughs> 
But onto the question of being a woman at the yeah. State Department, because part of your leadership, look, you've been a great leader at the State Department, <laughs> right? But it's been a pretty rocky road, in fact, to getting to, to that point, right? Yeah. Starting in Mogadishu, I know you have some uh, yeah. some comments about that. You you talk a lot about your bosses, which mm -hmm. is, I think, something that's a preoccupation of rules followers, perhaps. <laughs> you know, but but I mean, you had bosses that were understanding, and then others that were uh, kind of abusive, actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think the State Department, the military, the U.S. government in general uh, reflects our society. And so I joined the State Department in 1986, and I think in most organizations, whether it's academics, whether it's business, um, women weren't having you know an easy ride forward. Uh, there were women in, in the State Department. There were officers in the State Department that, that long preceded me. Um, but as recently as 1974, if you got married, you had to resign. Um, so, you know, that was not that long before I joined the, the State Department. And there weren't that many women, and there certainly weren't that many women in leadership positions. And so, back in the 1980s, I think some people might, might remember that time, you know, I, I was looking at role models, and they were all men, and so I wanted to look like a little man. And so I had, you know, a boxy suit, and back in the day we had these, like, little ties. <laughs> And, you know, that's what I wore, um, in part to, you know, blend in more. I mean, it didn't really work, of course, <laughs> but, you know, there was always the hope that, that, that it might. So when I went to, um, to Mogadishu, I did not have the assignment that I wanted. I wanted to be working on policy issues. I wanted to be working on political things. I wanted to do political reporting. And I had been assigned, when I came into the State Department, to to work on administrative things, and so uh, as my specialty. And I thought, well, I'm going to take this, and I'll see whether I can switch at some point, which was a very difficult thing to do. But I didn't know that at the time. And you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss, <laughs> and you just you know keep on following your path and try to make it work. So I ended up in 1986 in Mogadishu, Somalia, and that was a um, it was just a really difficult tour. I mean, it was uh, very, very far away. There was one other woman at the embassy. Everybody I'd, who worked for me uh, was male. I had about 60 um, people working for me. And, you know, when I met the, the section chiefs, um, one of them um, sort of came into my office and sat down. He said, you know, I've been alive. I, I, I've been working here for longer than you've been alive. So I got that message, and I thought, you know, how can I convince him that, you know, I can be good at my job and that he, you know, I, I am deserving of his respect. It took a while, um, but I managed, uh, I, I managed that, that, that particular challenge. Um, but it was, you know, it's, it's just this indefinable thing that I think is sometimes hard uh, for, um, with all due respect, for, for, for men sometimes to understand, but something that every woman understands. So when I was in um, Somalia, um, occasionally, very occasionally, uh, we'd be invited to a Somali home. And, you know, so all of the women were in the kitchen and the out kitchen cooking and everything else, and they ate separately. And so, you know, I had this dilemma. What do I do? Um, you know, do I go and try to help? Um, or do I sit with the, the men, my, my colleagues, and uh, our counterparts? So, you know, at first I, I was like, well, I'll just go into the kitchen and try to help. And that was not welcome. The men didn't like it, and neither did the women. And I never did that again, <laughs> because that was clearly wrong. Um, but it, it never felt quite comfortable to me either. And so you just try to figure it out. But the way that I figured it out was um, the Somalis taught me, because um, on the one hand, uh, they, they knew I wasn't a man, <laughs> um, but they knew I was a counterpart and had to be dealt with on certain matters, and um, even though I was a woman. And so what happened is my, um, my employees and also the counterpart males in, in the Somali government uh, called me, they gave me this name. Um, so uh, my first name is Masha, uh, and they called me Mr. Mosh. Because, you know, I, you know I, I was a boss. I was somebody to be dealt with and somebody to be respected. But, you know, I, they couldn't call me Miss or Mrs. or anything like that because, you know, women aren't bosses. So I was kind of this third gender, which, uh, <laughs> you know, was new to me. 
Um, but when, you know, when I went on to other places in my career and talked to um, other women who had worked in the Middle East, this is very common. And so is the moniker Mr. Mosh. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it, 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 there are just all sorts of little indefinable things that um, one, one has to deal with. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you one more example from, from Somalia, which was the president's nephew apparently took a shine to me. I have no idea how he had seen me or anything like that. But all of a sudden, one day, I mean, and we had a diplomatic compound with, uh, you know, big gates and guards, and, um, and then in my building, there was another guard at the door before you would get into, you know, the offices and, and my office. And uh, so a man comes into my office and sits down and starts, you know, chatting me up. And uh, I was like, who are you? And, and I, I don't know exactly, did he think... I knew who he was or whatever, but anyway, I managed to get him out uh, of the office, and I went out to my staff, and I said, who was that? And, you know, nobody would say. Nobody would say. Because Somalia was a dictatorship, and it was a brutal dictatorship, and people were afraid. And that's how that guy got through, you know, two sets of gate guards. Um, and so finally, one of my um, employees uh, came in a little bit later, and he said, that's the president's nephew, and you need to do whatever he says. Well, that was not going to happen. <laughs> um, but this guy persisted uh, and persisted, and I thought, you know, I can handle this because, you know, at that time in the 1980s, I didn't want to, I was one of two women at the embassy. I didn't want to call attention to my gender, um, and I thought, you know, I can handle this uh, until the night that he showed up at my apartment, you know, roaring drunk and, you know, um, pounding on the door, and uh, you know, uh, my apartment too was on a guarded compound, and I lived on the seventh floor of an apartment building, and so that meant that he got again past two sets of guards, and somebody had told him where I lived. That did not feel good. So I went in the next day to um, to the security officer, who's there, you know, not only to defend us against terrorists, but also you know help us with crimes and things like that. Not that this was yet a crime. And I, um, I said, that, you know, I explained uh, what had been going on, and I said, you know, I was a little nervous since now he apparently had access to my living quarters. And so I bet every woman in the room knows what the, what the response was. He said, don't encourage him. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's why, that's why I didn't come to you in the first place. I mean, I was fortunate that um, somebody else heard uh, that, you know, when the security officer said that, I thought, he's not hearing me, and he's not going to help me, and what do I do now? Um, but he did hear me, um, and there must have been a meeting because somebody else um, took action, and, um, and I never, never saw that the, the, the nephew again. But it gave me this teeny, teeny little insight of what it was to be a Somali, and a Somali woman especially. Because, you know, the men in the office, they were not, you know, they knew that this guy was powerful and that this was a very um, ruthless regime and that they couldn't get in this guy's way. Uh, and I, I thought, you know, what about Somali women? I mean, I had the means to, uh, to push back, but, you know, most women in Somalia probably wouldn't have had that opportunity or, or the ability uh, to do that. And it was a very, very sobering thing to think about what does it mean to live in a dictatorship. So, I have lots more examples, but um, I would say, you know, I, 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 I actually, can I just go on? Sure. <laughs> so I was very intent on getting into the, the political side of things at the State Department, and I'm not going to um, go on and on about how I did that uh, or all the steps I tried to take in order to get political assignments. But in the end, what happened was there was a class action lawsuit that had been brought decades prior to my arrival at the State Department by a woman. And uh, the State Department fought it for decades. Um, and then in 1993, or 1992, uh, I think it was, um, uh, a court found uh, that the State Department, uh, and this has gone through various levels of courts, um, that the State Department discriminated against women uh, with regard to the examination that was being provided for intake. 
uh, with who they selected to take into the State Department, with the specialties that they assigned women, uh, with the assignments that they gave women, and promotions. So pretty much across the board, the State Department was discriminating. The only reason that the State Department took action was because they were forced to by court order. And I was one of the very lucky people in that first tranche, one of 14, who had an opportunity to go into the political, political area of work. Um, and so I chose um, to go to Moscow. And that was really, in many ways, uh, the beginning of my career. And because there was um, this deep resentment uh, about that particular lawsuit, I mean, people, many in the State Department, and when I say many, I mean men, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, felt it was, you know, wrong and deprived them of, you know, their uh, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought, you know, I'm not going to share this story with anybody. And I didn't. I didn't talk about it at all until uh, I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was important to put in the book because I think sometimes our institutions don't live up to our ideals. Sometimes the, the institu our institutions don't live up to their ideals. And so sometimes we need to you know, not only work hard and try everything you can, but you also need to use other, other tools um, like the law. That's great. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask a question that I like, <laughs> or really my particular interest and concern. I, honestly, another of the aspects of the book that got me, that fascinated me, was your account of being in the Moscow embassy at the time that Yeltsin was shooting yeah. at the parliament building in 1993. That was right about when you had arrived, I think. Is that right? And yeah, it was shortly after I <clears throat> arrived. So. And so there's this firefight going on. To some extent, you're sort of going in and out of it, um, trying to figure out what to do. And so here's the question. It's kind of a long question, OK? But, <laughs> but basically, it's about Yeltsin, in, mm -hmm. in essence, right? It's the Yeltsin question. It's like, Okay, so you go through this firefight where, where you know, his people shoot somebody in the embassy, right? Um, where he's shooting at the elected parliament, right? And you express some misgivings, actually, in the book about that event. But in the end, you say, well, Yeltsin seemed like he was a Democrat. He seemed like he was supporting the West. And, and so we thought it was a better bet to move that, that direction. And then the other thing that um, that you talk about later, a little bit later on is the loans for shares deal, oh, yeah. which you excoriate because you're a corruption fighter. I just have to say that the, in the book, another of the themes that comes through is very clearly is if you, the one thing you were to identify your career with, which makes it <laughs> ironic, the whole Trump thing, is that you were fighting corruption pretty much everywhere you were at. And you saw that probably as like the key thing that you were doing, one of the key things that you were doing in your service in the government. Okay, so here's the mega biggest corruption ever. Yeah. Right. Which is this loans for share thing, probably the the, st the steal of a century, right? And yet, after that, uh, again, it, it's like, well, yeah, this was terrible, but we still supported Yeltsin, right? And and so, you know, it, to to my mind, I guess that um, I don't see how one squares that at Yeltsin. Like, why why did? And another perspective on it, if I can ask the question in a different way, is to say, today here we are. Okay. <laughs> with a war between Russia and Ukraine. If you, if you sort of had read the book, you might think, okay, Ukraine's this terribly corrupt country, right? Um, Russia has had various problems too, as from by dictatorship, of course, but would you have predicted, say in 1993, that there would be war between Russia, the dictatorship, and Ukraine, the sort of like model democracy? <laughs> I wish I were that good. <laughs> that I could have seen that in 1993. Um, <clears throat> Anything more? Because that's I mean, a, just, just, I guess, a lot in there. <laughs> I guess the thing is, did we did U.S. foreign policy terribly mess up its analysis of Yeltsin? Because Yeltsin mm -hmm. led directly to Putin. It was Putin was appointed by Yeltsin, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the things that we were supposedly trying to avoid in 1996 came true, you know, with Putin just a couple of years later because of Yeltsin in a lot of ways. Yeah. So. Um, so one of the things I want to say is that in the 1990s, I was very, very junior and not responsible <laughs> for that. <laughs> um, and I also, honestly, uh, and I tried to make this clear in the book, um, I'm not completely aware of all of the conversations that took place either, you know, within the embassy, with Washington, or, you know, with Yeltsin and other, other key figures. So, you know, I, 
I wrote what I knew in, in my book. Other people can write what they knew um, in, 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 in their memoirs. Um, but one of the things that I try to, um, I don't know, make clear, including you know my time as ambassador where I do bear responsibility for various things because I was a part of that policy process and certainly the implementation process, is that um, often in foreign policy, often in diplomacy, um, you know, it's not a choice between, you know, the obvious good thing and the obvious bad thing. Often it's just, you know, two bad choices and which one are we going to take? Um, and how do we try to shape it in a way that makes it less bad? I mean, I, it, it's, um, yeah, it's, um, that's often uh, the way it is. And especially when you, you know, move those decision make, uh, d decisions up the food chain. I mean, by the time it gets to the Secretary of State or the President, pretty much it's a crisis, and so what do you do? And um, so going back to this particular uh, issue, um, as everybody here knows, the Soviet Union uh, was uh, dissolved in 1991. That was a, a very traumatic thing for, uh, for, uh, for many Russians and people in other republics and the new, that became uh, new and independent countries. And the transition to independence, including in Russia, was very um, bumpy uh, to be very diplomatic. Uh, and, um, you know, many people, uh, you know, um, became poor over overnight. Uh, and so the, the old guard, what I call the old guard, the communists, the nationalists, you know, sort of this uh, group of uh, various um, uh, politicians <coughs> who had a lot of support in the country, um, they basically uh, were in charge of the parliament, the Duma, and um, over uh, the next couple of years, they were, um, you know, there was serious politics going on. Imagine this, the parliament was um, thwarting the president. It would never happen in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just here to tell you it was happening in Russia. Um, and things spiraled over, over the three years and got out of hand because the stakes were very high. Um, and, um, you know, eventually, um, Yeltsin did some things that were illegal uh, in, in terms of um, firing uh, his vice president, um, disbanding the parliament, and um, the parliament took action and they, they sort of did a sit-in. And um, it became such a standoff over the peri a period of about 10 days that um, Yeltsin then um, basically put cannons on a bridge and fired into the White House. And the building, and behind that uh, White House there was a park and behind that park was the American Embassy. So we were like literally in the line of fire. I mean, it was, it was, it was quite something. And in the, the, the run up uh, to this standoff, I was going to work every day. <laughs> and, you know, in the beginning at the top of the little lane that led to the embassy in this cordoned off area, in the beginning there were, you know, these young police officers, they looked like they were 18 or something, and then there were conscripts who looked like they were 18, and then all of a sudden, you know, were the hard men um, who meant business. But, you know, we were still going to work every day, um, and, you know, it's like boiling a frog. Um, you know, you go in every day, and you, at least I, and part of this was my own inexperience, didn't realize how much more dangerous the situation was getting every day. And then, uh, and then there was the, um, the confrontation between Yeltsin and, and the parliament. And so I think the US at that point, um, it was President Clinton at the time, had a choice. Um, do we support the communists and uh, the nationalists who um, do not um, want good relations with the United States? Um, we don't know what they're going to One of the big issues that we were working with uh, Russia and Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus on at that point was the nuclear issue, lo loose nukes, trying to ensure that, um, that um, you know, we don't all of a sudden proliferate these things among, not only among nations, but uh, among criminals. Uh, and um, we had a lot of, you know, serious issues we were working with the Russians. Um, you know, these are people who want to go back to communism. And, you know, what gains had been made, and it was bumpy, uh, would have been lost. And so I think a decision was made that we were not going to, um, you know, slap Yeltsin on the wrist or impose any kinds of penalties or anything else. 
And um, you know, the fact of the matter is, I think that since at that point, uh, you know, Yeltsin um, probably felt it was you know his job, his survival, because if he lost his job as president, he would have been put in prison. And so at that point, it's very hard, I think, um, to kind of um, influence what a leader uh, is going to do because they're thinking not only about their jobs and their power, but about their survival and their family's survival. So um, I think we made a decision that um, you know, it wasn't good what Yeltsin was doing, um, but he had laid out a plan about elections coming up in, um, in December, uh, about a new constitution that would be approved by the Russian people uh, through referendum, et cetera, et cetera. And so this had the, the, the smell, at least, <laughs> of democracy. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was pretty clear that the other side, mm -hmm. the communists and the nationalists, were not going to go in any direction towards right. democracy or um, a market economy. They would not be good partners for the United States. And we thought it would, was probably a worse choice for the Russian people as mm -hmm. well. So we didn't intervene in any way. I'm not sure we could have intervened in any way. But here's the thing, with this and then the, the very corrupt loans for share deal uh, in 1996, um, you know, when we are uh, perceived to be close to a leader overseas that is not um, considered to be fully legitimate by um, you know, the people of the country, that affects our reputation as well. And so that, I think, is something always to be considered in terms of, you know, how, uh, you know, we, we need relationships with um, the leaders of countries, and we don't usually get to decide who those leaders are going to be. But how do we conduct that relationship, and what sorts of things do we say and do to indicate, um, you know, where, where we stand? Um, because, you know, we are a country of interests, and I think what we were doing then was... Um, was pursuing our interests as we understood them at the time. But we're also a country of values, and um, I think that that is actually our most um, powerful superpower, is our values. That is, you know, Ronald Reagan used to talk about the United States as being the shining city on the hill. And, um, you know, that has attracted all sorts of countries and people to our side. And so we also need to follow our values. And getting that balance right um, is really challenging. Yeah, I mean, so uh, obviously Russia, you know, the hope that Russia would become a democracy in 93 didn't really pan out, right? It became, you know, by far one of the worst dictatorships in the world. Um, and by contrast, Ukraine, which was uh, very, you know, widely seen as, as highly corrupt and probably accurately, and you did a lot of efforts in there to try and get them <coughs> on the straight and narrow, but how surprised were you that, that, that Ukraine ended up becoming this kind of like uh, taking a democratic path in yeah. the way that it has? So one thing on corruption, um, Ukraine was a corrupt country, um, and, and so was Russia. Mm -hmm. And so are most of the other countries um, of the former Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union was a corrupt country. And these are all legacy countries. Um, the leaders in the beginning um, had been, you know, in, in the Politburo. Uh, that's all they knew, uh, how to, uh, you know, steal from the people. The Soviet Union, I mean, part of the reason it fell apart is that it wasn't a government that delivered for the people. I mean, we have governments uh, not to keep, you know, corrupt people in, mm -hmm. in office, but because they're supposed to work for us and provide services to the people. And the Soviet Union failed miserably at that. And so what people would do when they couldn't, you know, get a doctor for their, do their daughter or when they couldn't get, um, you know, uh, this was in the days when the landlines were big, uh, a phone into their um, apartment and there was a three-year waiting line, um, you know, what do you do? You bribe somebody. You give the doctor a gift to treat your daughter. You find, you know, the, the, the guy who will um, put in a phone you know, after hours or whatever for a consideration. Um, corruption thrives um, when there is bad governance, uh, which is why um, it's good governance mm -hmm. and is, is such a key tenant of so much of what we, do, uh, what we do overseas. But it's not, you know, a Ukrainian thing. It's, it's a former Soviet Union thing because that was a legacy system. And how do you get rid of it as you are trying to build a new system? I mean, it's, it's, it's the work of generations. It's really hard because it's not just about putting in new laws or regulations. It's about changing a mindset. 
and actually showing people that um, they will get what they need even when they're honest. Um, and that's, you know, uh, that just takes time. So to your question, um, I mean, Ukraine, uh, I think, has always been different from Russia. I think that's something that Vladimir Putin has never understood. Um, so the Ukrainian people, I mean, they are a freedom-loving people. They are, you know, raucous and uh, wild and are, uh, you know, have been fighting the Russians for centuries and um, aren't going to let the Russians push them around. And I think we're seeing that now. Uh, and, you know, back in the day, um, I was there from, nine, uh, from 2001 to 2004, and then I came back in 2016. So in 2001, there was the beginnings of activism and people um, wanting something different, but not having much of a base and experience for how, how, do you, how do you make your government more accountable? How do you, how do, you, how do, you do this, all of this stuff? But there, there was the beginnings of that. Uh, and so that was 2001, 10 years after independence. And in 2004, right after I left, although there's no connection, <laughs> there was the Orange Revolution. And, um, you know, people were angry that uh, the pro-Russian candidate uh, had fiddled the elections and um, had won the presidency. They knew that that was, that, that that was, uh, that that was wrong, that the outcome should have gone to uh, Yushchenko, the um, pro-European candidate. And um, so they took to the streets and um, were successful uh, in that a court uh, determined that there needed to be another runoff, and Yushchenko did win. Unfortunately, his, um, his time in leadership was very disappointing, and the reforms that the Ukrainian people were expecting and that we were expecting did not, did not move forward. And so, so what happened is in, 2014, in 2013, when the next president, um, uh, was in office, uh, and he was widely known to be very, very corrupt. And, um, but he was also, you know, playing all sides, and it looked like he was going to sign an agreement for a closer association with the EU. And um, the Ukrainian people were very much in favor of this. And again, you know, just like in the United States, I mean, nobody sits around, <laughs> you know, in their houses and goes, you know, do I want democracy or do I want communism? Do I want a market economy? No, I mean, the conversation, I mean, maybe in <laughs> historians <laughs> and political, you know, poli sci classes and stuff, we talk about these terms. But um, most people don't. I mean, they say, you know, I want, uh, I want a good, steady job. I, I want opportunities for my kids. I want to be secure. You know, I want the police force to be doing what it's supposed to do. And you know, if I don't like my local mayor or the president, I want to be able to vote that bum out of office. You know, I want to be able to hold politicians accountable. And that's what the Ukrainians wanted as well. And they especially, um, and this is true in the United States too, were looking at the economy. And they saw a closer association with the EU as a way to build up the economy. It would um, enable uh, trade back and forth much more easily. Um, you know, students could study in, in, in Ukraine. Um, there would be all sorts of opportunities, easier to work there, uh, all sorts of opportunities. And when Yanukovych, the president, turned his back on that um, after huge pressure uh, from Putin, who um, provided a $3 billion loan to Ukraine that was never seen again, um, he, um, he refused to sign the document. And um, so a, a bunch of college students protested on the square because they were seeing their futures flash in front of their eyes. You know, they weren't going to be going to, you know, to, to Germany to study. They weren't going to be able to get a job in Austria or wherever they wanted to get a job. And so they protested on the street. And Yanukovych, being the thug that he was, he, um, he cracked down on them. And a uh, newspaper um, uh, writer, um, a journalist, saw that and put on Facebook, this is wrong. Let's go out and support our students. So that was in November 2013. And, you know, probably 20 students, another 20 people. And day after day, in a, during a very, very cold winter, the crowd grew. And by February, Yanukovych was out of a job. He and $40 billion and lots of cronies ended up in Moscow and other places. So um, it was, and, and the, the name of that revolution was called the Revolution of Dignity. 
And what that meant was I, as an ordinary Ukrainian citizen, want to be treated with dignity. I want to, you know, when I go, uh, you know, drive my car down the street, if I'm going the speed limit and there's no problem with my car, I don't want to be stopped by the policeman and shaken down um, so that I can continue on. You know, I, I, I want to be, um, I want the rule for me to be the same as the rule for the president, and I also want the president to be held accountable for stealing $40 billion. And um, it was about the rule of law. Um, but again, I think, you know, people called it dignity. I, I want to be, you know, a dignified person. I want to be treated with dignity by the authorities. And um, so the next government, the Poroshenko government, came into office with a huge mandate to, to do something about corruption. And over the, um, the 25 years, I guess it was, of independence, there was a civil society base. There were people that had studied in the United States, worked in Europe, um, were adept at writing laws, knew about you know, different kinds of constitutions, knew about corruption and how to stamp it out. And so reformers in civil society, outside of government, reformers in government came together and worked out kind of a platform for, for the way forward in 2014 when the new government came into office. And the international community, the US, European countries, um, the uh, international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, we all came together and worked together, as opposed to at cross purposes, <laughs> which sometimes happens, um, and said, um, and came up with a plan. And what, what, what we did, the internationals did, is say, we will fund this, but we've been funding you for the last 24 years or whatever it was at that point. And so we are gonna condition our assistance. You know, you need to do this, and then we will give you the next tranche of, you know, and we're talking about a billion dollars to keep the government afloat or whatever it was. Um, and then we, will, um, then we will provide our assistance. So it was um, the program, the government program was agreed uh, with the government and with, um, with the internationals and, and with civil society. And there were some remarkable achievements during, uh, during those years. And so when we talk about uh, corruption, in Ukraine, I, I sometimes think it's really unfair because the reason we talk about it and not about corruption in, in Russia is that the Ukrainian people are talking about it and they're saying, we want to put an end to it. Mm -hmm. So to the, your question of Ukraine as a democracy, Ukraine is a democracy. Uh, it doesn't mean that they haven't had problems with some of their elections, but um, mostly um, their elections are free and fair, although we don't actually use the, that, that nomenclature anymore. Uh, mostly their elections um, are, are actually pretty good. Uh, and, um, and I think that in terms of the reforms that we're seeing the Ukrainians do, you know, prior, of course, to um, February 24th, um, they're trying to move forward in the direction of um, a liberal democracy and a market economy. But again, this is a slow, slow process. Um, it takes generations. Um, but I think they're on track to do that, and I think they will be on track to do that. Um, so, you know, democracies are, are, are always flawed, including our own, and the Ukrainian democracy certainly is as well, but it is a democracy. Mm -hmm. And um, I certainly saw the possibility for that back in, you know, when I first encountered Ukraine in 2001. And so, no, I haven't been surprised by, by this mm -hmm. evolution. But the, but the thing is, it's hard work, and it's slow work, and progress is never, you know, straight line, no zigzags, you know, often there are steps backward as well. And we are often impatient. You know, we want to see things happen quicker, uh, as do the Ukrainian people, and we want to see things happen, um, you know, sometimes in an election cycle, an American election cycle. Uh, and that's just not the way progress happens. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel, we're, I'm going to turn this over to the audience now um, to ask questions, so prepare mm -hmm. your questions. But just to say that a couple things, one is that, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a social scientist, I, I realize that we think about things much more in terms of causation, right? That's the fundament of how we think mm -hmm. about the world. And, and the two elements that I see as differing between Ukraine and Russia you mentioned mm -hmm. were the mobilization of civil society, yeah. which was so much greater in Ukraine for, yes. for various reasons, but also the turnover of government. Mm -hmm. That even, yeah, when you had bad, yeah. even when you had bad leaders, mm -hmm. quote unquote, from the Western point of view, Yanukovych, those people arguably furthered 
um, democratization, actually, just by the virtue of the very nature mm. of the fact that the government and is alternating. And his election was a clean one. And changing. Yes, he was elected. And, okay, he did, would definitely was anti-Western, but the fact that he was there and the fact that there were elections that happened afterwards and, you know, was deposed, whatever. Yeah. Um, those were all um, things that were different <coughs> that, those with are good Russia. Points. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, I think that um, at this point, you know, we've sort of brought it up a little bit to the current day issues. I can imagine a lot of the questions are going to surround the Ukraine war mm -hmm. and, also, um, and also the whole Trump experience mm -hmm. and, and other things. Um, but I don't want to predict, you know, too much. <laughs> um, you can ask any question you want. And just to say also that I think what you've heard in this um, in this commentary so far is this incredibly, what comes through in the book, incredibly sort of detailed and generative and very interesting and intricate view of Ukraine and of Russia, which we're focusing on, but also Armenia, uh, where you also served, and also Kyrgyzstan. Uzbekistan and also Kyrgyzstan, mm -hmm. uh, Somalia, same way, mm -hmm. right? You know, so the the thing is, I think that you 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 get, I think, from the perspective of being ambassador in all these different places, is that. You have this incredibly wide experience, which really comes through very nicely, I think, in the book. And just as you can speak eloquently about Ukraine, you can also, um, I'm sure, hold forth about all these other issues, which would require us to spend considerably more time here. We don't have, but you can do that. <laughs> we're going to hold you hostage. The book. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we're open to questions at this point. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. It's wonderful to hear you. Um, you know, it occurred to me. Is part of what has happened with Ukraine that we in the United States over the last 20 years have essentially wasted our power? Have we wasted ourselves in the Middle East? Have we misunderstood what our interests were? I'm just wondering if Putin would have done what he is doing if he hadn't seen what happened in Afghanistan. I just would like to hear your reflection. And I think there are two women in the third and fourth row who had their hands up. Yes, is that correct? Or just one now? Both mm -hmm. of them? Okay. So why don't we also, we're going to take a round of questions, so three, and then we'll go to the next. Thing. Madam Ambassador, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for your service and thank you for continuing to inspire, inspire women all over the world. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so nice. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Um, seeing what you've been through probably changed some career plans for the next generation. And I'm wondering, what would you tell our future about a career in the Foreign Service, mm -hmm. and how would you encourage them to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, so I, it, just to remark, I mean, these are two of the questions that I had on the, on my list as well, <laughs> right? You know, reading this book is kind of terrifying, I would imagine, for women going into the Foreign Service, right, what you said, and, and yet things have changed, I presume, they, but also then changed. the question about U.S. power, mm -hmm. right? Where are we at with are U.S. power? Are we gonna power? take another one, or? I think that's good, yeah. I think uh, okay. we can go with those. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to the first question about U.S. power and how do we use it and how do we use it appropriately and does it, has it served our interests over time? I think, um, I, I, you know, I think that that's a really good question and I think it's hard um, to give the answer today because, uh, you know, I just remember when the Soviet Union was dissolved, and I thought, wow, you know, I mean, I didn't think the end of history, <laughs> but um, I thought, um, you know, there's all these opportunities now, and, um, you know, we're going forward. Um, I, I actually thought that there was going to be a great partnership with Russia. Um, we sort of certainly tried to make that happen in the 1990s, and obviously that did not come to fruition in, in the way that we had hoped. And so, you know, if you were writing um, an historical book or a political science book uh, in 1995, I think um, it, it would seem, you know, to put it crudely, the West won in 1991. But actually, I'm not sure that's the case. You know, I, I, I wonder if we look back in 50 years or 100 years, I, 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 
I wonder where we're going to see the hinge moments in history. Is it going to be 1991? Is it going to be 9-11? That was another moment where we thought, uh, oh my god, you know, everything has changed. Um, and I think right now we are in one of those hinge moments, um, the, the world pre-February um, 24th, and um, everything that comes after. And, um, you know, this is a war about Ukraine. I mean, Putin has an obsession about Ukraine. Uh, this is about his legacy. It's about recreating the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire, however you want to look at it. Um, you can see the progression over the last two decades with, you know, um, his actions in Chechnya and then Georgia, grabbing hunks of Georgia in 2008, um, you know, uh, Ukraine in uh, 2014, and now Ukraine again. And so I, I, I do think um, that um, Putin would have ended up in this same place. Um, I do think that he took Sukhr in um, our withdrawal from Afghanistan. That was clearly chaotic. And, um, and I think he thought uh, that we would not have the wherewithal to muster um, the allies behind us um, to, um, to, first of all, strengthen NATO, um, bolster the, the eastern flank, um, the frontline countries there like Poland, uh, support Ukraine uh, to, you know, incredible um, uh, levels and um, enact, you know, huge sanctions and other forms of, you know, whether you call it deterrence or punishment on, on Russia. So um, I, don't, I don't think I'm really giving you an answer to your question, um, but I, I do think that um, the jury is still out on the actions of the last uh, 20 years or so. And I think that the way we are, we, you know, this generation, of leaders is going to be remembered is how we handled um, the Russian invasion. Because for me, it's not just about Ukraine. And I think for Putin, it's not just about Ukraine. Because I think he has made it clear uh, that he does not believe that the rules-based international order that was established back you know, after World War II and in the decades after that with new institutions like the UN, like the IMF, World Bank, all of those. Um, and, you know, uh, various agreements and treaties, and also just a set of principles that were enshrined, you know, in the UN, um, in uh, OSCE, and in other organizations uh, about how, how we deal with each other internationally, that borders are inviolate. You can't just grab a hunk of Alaska, which used to be Russian, by the way, and there are, uh, you know, right-wing politicians in Russia that, you know, think Alaska should still be part of Russia. So think about that for a moment. And um, I think that, um, you know, the inviol uh, al also the idea that sovereignty, that countries are sovereign. They get to decide what happens in their own country internally, but they also get to decide what ha their own foreign policy and national security and what alliances they want to form. And that has kept, uh, I think, much of the world, you know, more secure, more prosperous, and more free for the last 70 years. And I think right now what we're seeing is a test of that. Um, if Putin prevails in Ukraine, I don't believe he will, if, we, if, the, if Ukraine can stand firm and if we can stand firm behind them. Um, but if Putin prevails in Ukraine, he will keep on going. Maybe not immediately, but he will keep on going. And we will be less secure and less free and less prosperous. So um, I, think, I, I think that this is, this is a moment. And we not only need to deal with this part of it, you know, the security aspect uh, of it, but we also need to think about what does the international rules-based order look like for this century and perhaps beyond? Because, you know, it's not, we don't live in a world of the world of 1945 or 1950. We need to think about the challenges of today and um, what the structures and uh, norms are going to be for the future. And I think that is a real challenge. Um, but we are in a crisis right now, I believe. And so hopefully we will be able to meet that challenge. So the Foreign Service. So <laughs> um, I mean, I, um, I loved my time in the Foreign Service. And um, I recommend it to um, people coming up. I get a lot of questions from students and from others about joining the Foreign Service or doing something in foreign policy. I think there's so many different ways that one can, um, can work on foreign policy. 
Uh, I don't think the Foreign Service is for everybody because um, you move every couple of years, you know, not just like to another apartment or another house, <laughs> whole other country. <laughs> and, and you're also moving your job and you have to prove yourself all over again in a new job, even as you're, you know, settling in. And um, I'm single, it was hard for me because I didn't have, you know, my own little support system moving with me. But my married colleagues have a lot of challenges too because um, often you have spouses who, you know, want to work, want meaningful work, and how do you, how do you make that happen in a way that, um, that uh, works for that particular family unit? You're, you're pulling your children out of school every two or three years. That's not a life for everybody. And I think people need to be realistic about the challenges. And, you know, now in an increasingly dangerous world, we're often separated from our families um, because of, you know, one crisis or, or another. But um, the reason I love the Foreign Service is that you get to do meaningful work. And uh, I felt that I was making a difference every day. You know, sometimes not in the big, you know, the big, like the big foreign policy challenges of, you know, the international order and how do we create something that is meaningful and effective for the times we live in today. Um, but there are all sorts of other smaller things that you can do. And I would advise people when I was ambassador to pick small projects, not, you know, smaller projects, um, that you could accomplish in two or three years so that you have that even as, uh, you know, hopefully you are, um, you know, making peace in the Middle East and, you know, you, you leave that country and it's done. Um, but that doesn't usually happen. I mean, usually what happens in foreign policy and at embassies is we're planting the seeds. We're managing problems. We are trying to, you know, keep keep problems contained until the right minute when you actually can make progress, until you actually can solve a problem. Um, George Schultz called this tending the garden, that um, diplomacy is not, you know, very glamorous work for the most part. It's, you know, every day just tending the gardens, pulling out the, the weeds, the problems, um, fertilizing the roses, making sure that, you know, putting in the seeds at the right time, fertilizing them so that, you know, everything comes up, roses. <laughs> Um, those are our relationships around the world, um, whether they are with allies or with adversaries, where you know you want to make sure the weeds are contained, our adversaries, and um, that we, we've got that good relationship with with our allies. So when there's a crisis, we're ready. We're all ready. Um, so um, you know, I, when I was in Armenia, it did not look like Armenia was ever really going to um, become a reforming kind of a country. And um, as I was leaving Armenia, uh, a political prisoner who had been in jail the whole time uh, that I had um, been in Armenia, and we'd advocated for his release very strongly for years, he was released. And in 2018, he became the prime minister. So, and, you know, and there followed uh, reforms. Again, not as fast as everybody wants, but it was a sea change. And so, you know, you plant the seeds, you keep on hoping um, that, you know, work with civil society, work with others, um, that it will bear fruit. And, you know, often it does, just not on our timelines. Okay, well, um, that was <laughs> terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah.